Welcome to Blindspot, an audio podcast series about forensic science and the role forensic experts play in our judicial system. The name Blindspot comes from the fact that forensic experts can see and hear what laypersons cannot. Forensic experts reveal the blind spot in court using their experience and expertise as forensic scientists. In this episode of Blind Spot, I'm going to discuss the importance of a chain of custody when authenticating digital media evidence for use in the courtroom. I'll identify what the chain of custody is and the role that it plays in presenting digital media evidence. The chain of custody must account for the seizure, storage, transfer, and condition of the evidence. Without this chain of custody, evidence used in the courtroom will be challenged and may be ruled inadmissible. Forensic software allows me to look at the metadata or digital information of an audio and video recording, but it doesn't always allow me to understand how that recording was created. Just because the information is missing from the metadata doesn't mean that a recording has been compromised. This is why the chain of custody information is important to a forensic examiner, because that helps me understand where the file came from, who created it, and the type of equipment that was used. That way, if I want to create a comparison file or exemplar, I can acquire the equipment, create the exemplar, and compare it to the evidence to confirm the file properties. When I testify in court with a piece of evidence, I'm always prepared with a chain of custody. As I mentioned earlier, without a complete chain of custody, it can become very easy for the opposing attorney or prosecutor to challenge or dismiss the evidence that I'm presenting. Having a completed chain of custody form, as well as any other accompanying forms, and including any visual proof of retrieval, such as pictures or video, greatly help prove the authenticity and admissibility of the evidence in court. Recently, new ways of establishing a chain of custody have come about and are slowly becoming accepted in the legal community. Online services are now available for digital evidence that record the chain of custody and who's received the evidence. The evidence is stored in cloud space and eliminates the need for repeated transfers of physical copies. It maintains standardized security procedures and is also useful as a backup storage service for surveillance cameras. Chain of custody is important to the court because if I find something wrong with the evidence during the authentication process, it allows us to go back and determine who was responsible for the evidence up until that point. The chain of custody is important to the investigation because it's the first step when authenticating digital audio and video evidence. Identifying this chain of custody provides information about whether or not this evidence has been copied or cloned. As technology advances and becomes more accessible, digital media evidence has become easier to edit, modify, and alter. The Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence defines an original as the physical items and the data objects associated with such items at the time of acquisition or seizure. It's not always possible to receive the evidence from its original source at the time of acquisition or seizure. Very often, I receive digital media evidence from a client who may have received it from the police or another source. When this occurs, I have to pay careful attention to the reports, the depositions, and other legal documents that accompany the evidence. This paper trail must put together an unbroken timeline that shows exactly where the evidence has been between its creation and my examination of it. When I encounter any gaps in this timeline that can raise questions to the authenticity of the evidence, further investigation becomes necessary. There are occasions when I'm asked by the client to physically retrieve the evidence directly from the recorder that created it. This process creates the chain of custody for my investigation. When an expert creates the chain of custody, it removes all doubt as to the authenticity of that evidence. This process has become more common throughout my investigations when the original evidence is available for my retrieval. To further authenticate this process, I create audio and video recordings of the retrieval process, which becomes part of my chain of custody. In addition, when I'm at the site and I retrieve the digital evidence, I have access to the administrator information about that evidence, such as the administrative log, 
Dayton file information, and other people who have accessed the files. The more information that an expert can retrieve strengthens the authentic chain of custody that is created. One of the recent evidence retrievals that I went on required the original hard drive to be brought into a conference room so that both sides in the litigation had access to retrieving the evidence and examining the hard drive. The entire day's evidence retrieval process was video recorded, and both experts had an opportunity to examine the files and retrieve them from the digital video recorder. Another case that was very similar didn't have the digital video recorder to retrieve the evidence from. Rather, the evidence was provided on disks through each attorney. It was very difficult to establish a chain of custody because that download process was very complicated. It required remote access through different internet protocols, and the lack of having access to that hard drive to retrieve the evidence from directly raised doubt throughout my forensic investigation as to the authenticity of that evidence. Two cases, very similar circumstances. One had evidence retrieval, the other didn't. The one that required me to travel to the location to retrieve the evidence allowed me to establish a solid chain of custody of that evidence right from the get-go. Our chain of custody process when we receive evidence directly to our offices is first we save the original packaging material so that we can document who sent the evidence and when it was received. Next, we take photographs of the physical evidence itself. We load the evidence into the computer and we take screenshots of the digital evidence. We document the date, time, and any other information about the receipt of that evidence and what we see during that initial examination. We ingest a bit-for-bit -bit clone of the digital evidence content into our forensic computer. We perform a hash test analysis to further authenticate the working clone. All of this information that we conduct during the initial investigation is very important when we create a chain of custody, which is also very important and necessary to include in our forensic report. When examining digital media evidence, especially digital audio and video recordings, the forensic expert should never examine the original file. Always make sure that when you process a piece of evidence, that you work on the copy of that evidence file so that the original remains untouched at all times. That way, if you have to go back and compare your work product to the original, you'll have that original file preserved. It doesn't matter what forensic science you are an expert in. The chain of custody is always important. And maintaining that chain of custody is crucial for the credibility of your work product and your eventual testimony. This concludes this episode of Blind Spot. If you subscribe to this podcast, you'll be notified of future episodes as they're produced. We welcome your comments and questions at primoforensics at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. In this episode of Blind Spot, I want to discuss continuing education in your field of expertise and the importance of continuing education in remaining a credible forensic expert. I just got back from a continuing education trip to Portland,